All right, friends. Today on Crypto Internet, we have Gary Rigger, CTO of Haylayer. You'll learn on this episode that Haylayer is creating really interesting NFT opportunities on Bitcoin by building smart contracts in tandem with the Stacks blockchain. Residio CEO Peter Ponton has also joined the stage. Now, Residio's core purpose is to empower artists with Web 3.0 technology using the power of NFTs and crypto. Haylayer and Residio are both part of the Stacks Accelerator, led by managing partner Trevor Owens, who, is, who has joined us on the stage today. We're going to get into introductions in just a minute, but first, who else here is super bullish on the innovation taking place on Bitcoin, thanks to Stacks and all the mentors who are contributing to the Stacks Accelerator? Now, some of you might be thinking, wait, what accelerator? And if that is you, do yourself a favor and take a look for yourself. Your idea could literally be the next big thing. To take a peek, head on over to stacks.ac. All right, here we go. I'm going to hand the mic over to our host, Muni Bali, co-founder of Stacks and Patrick Stanley, CEO of Freehold. Welcome. Awesome. Great to have it here. I feel like I'm like still energized by the demo day in the morning. Like that was, that was, that was amazing. And uh, I was also thinking, or, or I was on a call afterwards chatting with somebody. And I think that at this point, the Stacks ecosystem is by far the largest in the broader Bitcoin ecosystem. I think there are, there's something like more than a hundred full-time people working in like different entities, more than 30, 30 entities. I think in terms of capital, some of the fundraisers are not announced, but I think it's probably like something like more than 200 million in capital across, across a bunch of entities. And obviously people are raising more. And I saw some of the, the rounds that were getting uh, filled up for, from the seed stage companies that are, that are talking about. And I think like just just like taking a moment to recognize that, that if smart contracts are coming to Bitcoin or not even if, like they're here, like this is the community that is doing it, like by far within the Bitcoin ecosystem, like nothing else else comes close if you if you compare to like I don't know liquid or RSK or any 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 of the other uh, solutions out there so I think I think uh, take a moment to realize that and you know this this community is amazing and growing and I'm, I'm super excited about it today was kind of like a big big highlight we just we just did some stats actually last night real quick across our to 25 startups that are graduating um, they employ whether you know directly or through contract uh, over 200 people. It's like 212. Well, so I'm I'm off here. <laughs> yeah, so I think you're talking just like the you know the non-startup even ecosystem. Uh, yes. So yes. add another couple hundred at least. That's that's amazing. All right, I feel I feel like um, Patrick. Do you wanna you wanna chime in with something, or otherwise we can just dive right right in with the uh, with, with a guest. No, let's go. Let's go to the guests for sure. Yeah, why don't we start with uh, Gary from Layer? Do you want to give a little bit of an introduction on who you are and what you're doing? Sure. Nice to uh, see everybody. Um, and uh, some amazing people here. I just, you know, want to say, you know, Munib, it's like um, watching you on YouTube is one thing, you know, being on the stage with you is another. So I just uh, appreciate you and everything you've done. So um, off that, um, yeah, I mean, I'm more of a product guy. Um, you know, when I see the product, I feel it. And, you know, that's sort of like, you know, from an IT standpoint, I have people that just work with me and that are just so much smarter than me. So I lean on them. But, you know, I read the white papers. I understand that I take my time to, you know, get to the bottom of it on a basic level. And, um, yeah, I mean, to me, there's nothing like stacks because, you know, the way I see things is if I'm going to build something that is a, one of one digital collectible, you know, I want to tie it to the best thing in the universe, the best thing I can find, the most solid thing I can find, um, especially if it's a one of one, especially if it's important. And I think, you know, where we see NFTs, you know, right now everyone's looking at JPEG, but we know where this is going. And, you know, um, I love, like, the protocols are all amazing. And, the people are all working together, but someone's got to bring, you know, bring the local, local roads and the local bridges um, to town. And um, that's kind of how I see 
you know, what I'm looking to do with kind of stacks and NFTs. Cool. Yeah, I think, Peter? I think, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry, I was just going to chime in on one point. Uh, but yeah, by the way, thanks, thanks, thanks for the kind words. Uh, I think when you mentioned that hey, it's a one-on-one -on -one type of uh, NFT and it's kind of like tied to Bitcoin, like this came up in some of my discussions as well, where really it's about uh, these things being scarce, right? And what is more scarce in crypto than block space on Bitcoin? Like it is literally the most scarce thing and it is the most durable thing on the planet as well. Like for example, there were some people who were concerned about, hey, is this thing going to be around in like 20 years, right? So you're not only tying your NFTs with the most scarce kind of like space in crypto, the Bitcoin, the Bitcoin blocks, but you're also timestamping it on the most durable asset, right? So if five years from now, 10 years from now, Someone can say that at Bitcoin block number, you know, whatever, uh, it, if this thing was minted, they can they can independently verify. So, so, so the NFT actually becomes more valuable in my mind as the Bitcoin block space becomes more scarce or as previous blocks kind of like, you know, become historic. That there was a time when, you know, Bitcoin was at this stage and, uh, you know, the NFT minted at that time on Bitcoin. Would, would, would actually carry very some, some value. Awesome. Peter from Residio, do you want to take it away and give a little info on you and what Residio is up to? Yeah, thank you. And um, great to be here. And um, just listening to Manith there, it just became really clear once again just how much uh, how much there is to learn here and how much support you get in this incredible community. And just thinking about, you know, where we were when, when I first got involved, which is what probably getting on for about two years now and seeing how this ecosystem has, has grown. I remember we were looking at, you know, what is this ecosystem even just maybe like less than a year ago. And then when I look at how much it's grown, just in this year it's absolutely amazing so i mean just really well done to everybody that's put all the work in to make that possible the foundation has been amazing this accelerator program has been amazing um i can't i just can't think of another you know another technology project right now and i've been involved in a lot that i'd rather be involved in than this one it's it's absolutely incredible um so we're really excited to be you know, building on stacks. We've been building on stacks since before Minnet. You, probably, you guys probably know that. Um, and we're really proud about the work that we've been able to do this year alone and really looking forward to bringing this exchange functionality uh, and this platform to market this year. Um, and one of the things that I'm, you know, most excited about and most proud about being associated with stacks and with this community is the fact that you know it's actually good for the environment it can be good for the environment that's amazing and so when we talk to artists all over the world and that's one of the concerns that they raise the fact that we can address that in a positive way and do something positive about it is really really inspiring so i'm i'm, I'm loving this thank you that, that, that's amazing i appreciate all the kind words amazing to have you as part of the community I feel like, like when when I've been thinking about you know the the NFT space or uh, the the problems that people are solving in general, like think about it this way that people like getting paid in Bitcoin because they value Bitcoin. And they're like, okay, this is the thing that is the closest to being money, and as as the biggest kind of like brand name, and and you know like. It's, it also has this feeling of like it's something very valuable, right? Like you don't want to spend your Bitcoin if you're getting paid in it, it feels good. Because I've experienced that firsthand through these Bitcoin rewards that you get from uh, from Stacks Consensus, right? Like every time you, you get a reward slot, it's like, it's like for me, it feels amazing that Bitcoin is such a, such a valuable asset and you're kind of like earning more. And, and applying that to the NFTs and artists, like you can almost give them the same feeling, right? Like imagine that there is some sort of a, 
five percent, ten percent, whatever the number might be, uh, earning or reward kind of like a cash for an artist every time there's a secondary sale of their artwork. Right? It's going to feel like the uh, like the BTC rewards people people get, and that's just like a magical feeling. Like I think when that went by, people were literally sending me. Uh, you know, text messages or screenshots, they couldn't believe that they just got Bitcoin out of it. So if you, if you can, if the products can actually, you know, uh, work really well from a UX perspective, where the end result for an, for an artist is that your NFT is tied uh, with the ownership uh, on, the, on, on the Bitcoin blockchain, right? It, the, the, the provenance is going to be tracked on the Bitcoin blockchain. You can sleep well at night, that you know, this, thing, this thing is not going to happen disappear this is some catastrophic the likelihood of a catastrophic thing happening on the bitcoin blockchain is far smaller than anywhere else because it's it has a very small attack surface area it's been battle tested for 10 plus years and then you're going to earn in bitcoin every time there's a resale like i know that there are certain works we need to do to really get there because uh the, like you know i don't want to get into the technical details but there can be bitcoin representations or maybe some sort of swaps where uh, these artists are actually getting paid in Bitcoin. I know that we can even we even construct these the auctions in Bitcoin as well, right? So if there's NFT drop happening. Maybe people are just bidding on the main Bitcoin chain, and 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 the smart contract can pick that up. I think I think I don't want to get too technical about these options, but I want to think about it from a, especially from a product and artist experience point of view. That what do you want to tell them, uh, and what what experience are they going to have when they when when they use these marketplaces and they, they use these platforms? I mean that that to me that's certainly something I'm passionate about. You know, it's kind of funny. Like we started this thing. You know, I was uh, looking up the uh, the Stacks Discord, um, doing some DL kind of underground. You know, watching people and started making some friends. And this was a few years ago, but uh, we didn't start building until you know 2.0. Um, Having said that, you know, I was building sort of thinking about it from a storage standpoint. And so what we ended up building was like a Dropbox, you know, on top of, you know, the, the Stacks uh, storage system, Gaia, and, and it was just so easy to implement and kind of work with that. And then also the authentication was easy. So I was like, this, you know, this thing is solid. Uh, it's on Bitcoin. You know, this makes so much sense. Um, but as we entered the accelerator and we were sort of coached through, you know, the lean methodology and sort of validating our customers, um, like we already knew that a storage system, like especially if it just looks like a Google Drive or a Dropbox, you know, you can right click stuff. Like we knew that that was not going to be hard. You don't have to teach anyone how to do stuff. Um, and then once once sort of the, like the NFT wave came, um, it was just apparent that that was like the way where we were going to go. And then right click to mint became a thing. Um, and yeah, and so it just made you know, like I'm thinking about, you know, it doesn't matter what age you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. You know, you can, if you could right click, you, you, you know, so, and then working with files, you know, why not today that the idea of like, and I've been through the open sea process, you know, creating collections and things. It's not, it's not that hard, but why not just have a folder? You know, why can't we just drag a bunch of files in a folder and then the folder becomes a collection, you know, these things can just be made a lot easier. And uh, you know, I'm hoping that uh, we can make that happen. So that's kind of yeah. what I'm working on. I think I think you had some really interesting points here about uh, some of the some of the technologies that have been developed in the Stacks project. Like think think about NFTs, right? Like in many ways, NFTs are not new. Like you know, rare Pepe's were there on Counterparty, like God knows, in like 20, 2016 or something like that, right? Or 2015. And uh, but they just they feel like as if they just took off in the last six, seven months, but that's actually not true. There is a bunch of work that happened, right? Like a bunch of, you know, standards emerged, like a bunch of like tooling evolved, and even the marketplaces like OpenSea again feels like as if it just took off overnight. Uh, we we are a small investor in them, and I've actually seen OpenSea execute for years. Like they were in a YC batch three years ago, or and like every single month they would. You know, the founders would spend the update uh, diligently talking about what they're working on, how they're tracking their numbers. And during during those years, there were several times so many distractions in uh, in crypto, right? Like, like for example, DeFi was taking off last year. And so many people were trying to convince them to just forget about what you're doing 
and go work on like something else. They they kind of like they they were determined by the mission of what they want to do, and and boom, this year finally you know the various different pieces clicked, and NFTs feel like they're taking off. But I want to connect this point back to similar other uh, tooling and functionality that is needed for like a proper Web3 type of experience. And that tooling is around authentication systems, tooling is around, you know, cloud-like private storage. Um, it's about almost like having your uh, kind of like blockchain identity, right? Like, like not, not, not just like when you've got BBC type of a name, but a full-fledged like verifiable profile that you can use to log in. The Stash project has been working on this stuff uh, for years, that tooling is a lot more mature than some other ecosystems. We were actually behind on smart contracts. So, so you're seeing a lot of traction and interest because the mating chain went live like you know seven months ago. And now you have smart contracts. Obviously, smart contracts give everyone superpower. But interestingly, we made a ton of progress on storage, auth, like a bunch of these other web three contracts before. And and I am actually extremely confident. That that's going to come back to help us as people start start kind of like building out uh, more complicated systems. When they are like, "Hey, I actually like for example, let's say you're building a marketplace. You're building a marketplace, and then you're requiring a centralized login. Like that makes no sense, right? Like if you're if you want to be truly kind of like fully decentralized, and you want to be truly you know crypto native, then have a decentralized authentication system. Have and let the users kind of like own own their data and information, and, and maybe you know the next logical step from NFTs could be maybe social networks are going to start emerging. You're already already seeing like some of that. I feel like that years of work is just going to kick in, and then people would actually feel like, oh wow, like these this this ecosystem is actually thinking about these problems for years, and the the, the solutions are kind of like already there for me. And, and I can just kickstart my project because it's not just smart contracts. It has, it has the rest of the stack as well. It, it, Trevor, I, I wanna I wanna get some of your thoughts on the the. I know you have a second day coming tomorrow as well, and maybe you should get some sleep in in the middle. But what are, what are your thoughts on the on the day one? Oh man, I I'm super happy. I mean, I think um, the teams, you know, <laughs> it's been a stressful week. You know, entrepreneurs have a unique talent and a unique ability to pull off great things at the last moment. And I thought that might have been unique to myself as an entrepreneur in my past, uh, but I have confirmed that it's true with most entrepreneurs as of running this accelerator. And uh, it's been really, really great to see all the teams. I mean, they've come so far, they've worked so hard. And, you know, that's why our thesis is all about investing in the people, because you start with good people, you start with good teams, and they're going to figure it out. They're going to find a way to do something great. And that's just been shown, I think, by, by this demo day. And, you know, it's it's bittersweet in a way. I, I mean, we're going to be keep working with the teams over the coming months to make sure we support them in their uh, additional fundraising. Um, but uh, you know, it's kind of bittersweet to this this first cohort. This is like you know, the first cohort. It's like I don't know if I want to say it, it's like your first love or something like that. But you know, there's there's always going to be fond memories of this first cohort. Yeah, we were we we were the. Uh first bash that Sam Altman had at YC. And I feel like he, he had some sort of a special association with that batch. So Trevor, this is this cohort one is gonna be something like that for you. I, by the way, I don't I don't know if people know this that how far back Trevor goes. He was literally helping me and Ryan on our YC app when we were applying back in the day. And I remember his comments. I think his comments were you guys are just too humble. Like you're you're just like not 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 selling yourself, right? Like we are kind of like you know, engineers and we were there we were filling out the application and Trevor just like took over. And he's like, this is what you should say, right? And I I, I think what, the way Trevor positioned it 
uh, that actually helped that we, we we did get into YSA. And I feel like it's a similar type of a help that uh, these startups are getting, right? Like some of them might be more raw, some of them are actually like how we're very talented, but you know, might not know exactly how to present in front of investors. And I feel like it's it's a talent, right? And uh, if, if Trevor could, could could do it, like you know, eight years ago or something, I, I'm pretty sure he's only gotten better at it now. Yeah, it's it's funny that you say that, I Maniv. Mean, I still remember you guys were, I think, like working on your YC application. I think we were like at the alley, the co-working space in New York City. I remember. I like still remember the moment. Uh, it's so funny, um, but I think also. You know, it's just hard. Like one of the hardest things to do as an entrepreneur is to pitch your own business. Even myself, you know, being able to help all these entrepreneurs and having done so many pitches over the years, I even struggle uh, if I'm working on a business to pitch it myself because you're so immersed in it and you have such a like a broad view of everything you're trying to do that you kind of lose the sense of objectivity that someone on the outside looking at it from a more like objective lens or from an outside lens can see. So I think it just, it's a, it's a feature of being an entrepreneur that it's just really hard to pitch your business and to know uh, how other people are going to perceive things. And so, you know, it's one of the reasons why accelerators are so great because you get so many perspectives that you can kind of listen to the patterns from all the different mentors. And, you know, we have our whole team at Stack Accelerator putting multiple different perspectives on every person's pitch. And we even debate each other. You know, so many times Alex and I have like two completely different ideas about how to pitch something. And then we argue about, hey, we should do it this way. Or we, we, we argue the merits of it and then end up somewhere in the middle that ends up being like the most compelling way to, to pitch something. Yeah, I, I know the NFT demo day is tomorrow. So I can... I, I can I can plus from that and maybe uh, I know the pitches are probably probably ready to go. But even if if folks are talking to measures, I think like because you're too close to the problem and you can you can see the possibilities. Right? If you're like, hey, this is actually not just this, but it's more than that. Like we can do X on top or Y on top and whatnot. And I actually I should admit that the stacks project suffered. Like in the sense that I, I just mentioned, you know, our auth system and uh, storage system and, and whatnot. Like these are really important fundamental blocks, but they also kind of like make the overall picture more complex. So if you've noticed recently, like especially from, uh, from the mainnet launch and the, and, the, and the Stacks brand, I actually don't talk about any of those things anymore, right? It's, I'm only sticking with smart contracts for Bitcoin. Why? It's simple. Everyone gets it. Everyone kind of like gets excited about it. And it actually pulls them in, which is far more important than trying to tell them up front everything else that is possible. Right. And it was almost like a hard, hard learned lesson for me as well. That initially, like just go for, for the simplest possible thing that resonates and that clicks, but you have to actually um, go out and like talk to as many people and, and the type of pressure testing that you know uh, Trevor is talking about with, with Alex, you have to really do that honestly and then come up with like a very, very simple, I don't know if like smart contract for Bitcoin is perfect, but I feel like it's definitely the best thing that this community has had probably ever, right? Like it, and it, it, it just tells the story and this is intriguing enough that once it clicks that, oh, smart contracts can just happen around Bitcoin, then let them let, like let them figure out the rest, right? Like, oh, this is eventually going to lead to an entire kind of like web three built around it. But you you probably don't want to start. I, I think there is some version of that for every startup where you where you are looking at kind of like, hey, this is possible, that is possible, and this is the ultimate thing. But you need to start very 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 simple, uh, especially especially in the early days. Trevor, what can we expect tomorrow? Oh, I mean, tomorrow's going to be, it's going to be amazing. I mean, we have so many great companies that are, you know, I think for um, today, a, a lot of the companies are focused on, you know, more kind of back end stuff, right? So a lot of DeFi and a lot of fintech is like um, mainly focused on the back end, the protocol, and it's not as tangible per se as like some of the NFTs or Web 3.0 apps where it's like, you know, things that you could use today. You know, things like 
Saigo where you can set up a blog today and you can be, you know, have your decentralized blog that you have your content with you always. Or, you know, we have also a gaming company that's going to pitch tomorrow. And we have, you know, I see um, quite a few people in the audience like Mohammed is going to be pitching his communication suite and his messaging app that, you know, you can send people stacks from, from, from the Wise wallet and from the Pravdika suite. And so I think that tomorrow is going to be a lot more kind of tangible for people to see things that you can start using like today and start playing with and really get a, a better understanding of how the uh, Web 3.0 life is going to be like. Can I, um, if I may also add, since we are here uh, specifically right now with uh, Layer and Residio, two of the companies uh, that will be also presenting tomorrow, and are very exciting because uh, Layer essentially helps people mint easily and organize. Because right now, obviously, unless you're somewhat technical, it's not quite, I mean, I think Boom provides a uh, good functionality in the area as well. Um, but yeah, so Layer is, is one app, uh, another app that makes it easier to organize, mint, deploy to storefronts and like sell your NFT, uh, manage the royalties, et cetera. So basically the, the beginning journey of the NFT easy. And then Residio here with Peter takes over the second leg where, okay, now you sold your NFT, how are other people now going to buy it on resale? So uh, Residio is basically the open sea for NFTs on Bitcoin. And those two, I think, will be, you know, extremely important in the ecosystem, uh, needless to say, and very excited about that. Couldn't agree more. Thanks, Alex. Um, Robert Chung, you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so I think the first time, uh, just as like an introduction, uh, I think the first time I was introduced to Stacks was back in like 2017. Um, I went to Tree Hacks and I actually did like a hack for uh, for Stacks during that time. Um, and I've, I've been kind of in the crypto space uh, since probably like 20, uh, late 2015, early 2016. Um, and, and it like listening to all of this kind of discussion about Stacks makes me think that it's maybe trying to kind of accomplish some of the uh, same goals as maybe like Ethereum. Um, so I guess the basic question that I have is, I, I'm, a, I'm a little new to like Stacks 2.0. Uh, why choose kind of Stacks versus say like Ethereum other than the fact that it's kind of natively, Stacks is more natively Bitcoin versus like Ethereum is Ethereum. Oh no, sense. oh no, this is a rabbit hole. Who's gonna stop it before Trevor goes off? Would you? Would you like the red pill, Robert? Or the blue pill? The Matrix Four trailer just came out, which is awesome, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's great. So I think I think we we won't get into like all the different differences, but I would say that the, the, it's it, from a from a from a from a technical perspective, like you you have a secure base layer that is the money layer that has a very small attack vector. And then you have a separate layer, which is stacks, where, where which it can be more experimental than the base layer. Right? And it has smart contracts. Like it is, it is a, I would say a much more durable type of a design. And not to forget the type of security you get or the type of, uh, like, like imagine that likely one asset is going to end up being the reserve currency. Right. And right now, all signs in the world point to the fact that it's going to be Bitcoin. Right? Uh, I think even if you look at the last few months, um, recently, because of the traction Ethereum was getting on the smart contract side, that there was a narrative building that Ethereum is going to become money. Right? And just in the last week, we've seen like three other smart contract platforms take off, and suddenly everyone's like, oh, wait a minute, maybe smart contracts could be on many L1s. And I think people are still haven't fully realized that smart contracts can get to you know, Bitcoin. So the type of properties you need to be a good money in the world is very different from the type of properties you need to be a good smart contract. And the, the way this works in the stacks ecosystem is that those two separations are very clear. Bitcoin is money. That is the chain that you can rely on for the money and store of value type operation. And it's 
the best in the world for that. And Stacks is smart contract, and that and that is the thing you can rely on for the for the type of security you need from smart contracts. And obviously, I won't get into the details about the clarity language versus solidity and there's a bunch of other type of differences. Ethereum, by the way, is also going to move to proof of stake. So what you would have is you would have a list of like you know seven different projects that are all proof of stake, and then proof of stake has its own kind of like you know pros and cons. Uh, and 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 Bitcoin and Stacks are very different. Right? because they're not proof of stake. They are uh, maximizing for decentralization. They're maximizing for independent verification. And again, this is a rapid goal. It's a pretty, pretty, uh, pretty deep goal. Yeah, and I, I would add to that. One of the things that I tell people a lot is that uh, Bitcoin is a completely blue ocean green space opportunity. I mean, you have something like 200 million uh, Bitcoin wallets. Bitcoin is usually every person's first uh, entry point into the crypto space and um, a lot of that bitcoin is just for holding and for uh, a store of value and so the idea that now you can integrate that entire user base that entire capital base into your startup and there's no and there's like no competition yet because stacks is so new stacks is the first one who has a like mature and developer friendly experience that i feel is like powerful you know as a developer i'm a developer myself uh, looking at it is like uh, it's a huge opportunity. It's just and there's some unique things you can do uh, leveraging stacks with with Bitcoin that you can't just can't do with any other blockchain. So for me, it just comes down to the fact that there's this green space, blue ocean opportunity uh, to leverage Bitcoin and that capital, that user base. So big big plus one is that like it's a it's a trillion dollars in capital, and surprisingly. Like not a lot of people are trying to make it productive, right? So they're trying to build like separate ecosystem instead of going after this this blue blue ocean opportunity. Yeah, Colin tells us that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say I think um, for the most part, I think I've I agree like Bitcoin is king, and I think the idea, if I'm echoing uh, correctly, is is that you guys want to kind of build on top of. Uh, what's already there instead of kind of working on like if like if if I have to create like an NFT on Ethereum, uh, I could technically transfer that to or get the value out of it with Bitcoin via like uh, going to like an exchange. But instead, what you guys are saying, you want to kind of have it all natively in Bitcoin, so you don't have to go through all those kind of steps. And I think yeah, I think that makes sense. The other thing that I wanted to point out is like tapping into the whole proof of transfer and re Bitcoin rewards piece of stacks is just unreal <laughs> for me because obviously like who doesn't want Bitcoin rewards and you know then you think about NFTs as sort of like the Brit you know the maybe there'll be like some word uh, for it you know where where it's like some new three letter or uh, four letter acronym but. You know, like NFTs and DeFi are going to sort of smash together. I think we're seeing that now. And um, like, actually, I guess this question for Muneev, like I have some kind of wild thoughts of like, and theories of like where this might go, uh, of like, you know, different things with NFTs and, um, leveraged by uh, Bitcoin. But I was just curious, like what some of your thoughts are, um, if you could talk to that. Yeah, I feel like this is, uh, this is like, the power of when you make things programmable, like they're all kind of like in the same ecosystem. So if you have if you have a ton of capital that's just sitting there as Bitcoin, not only that the capital could be deployed into the NFT or DeFi space, but then they start kind of like overlapping with each other. Like, like, like have you already seen some ideas where these NFTs could earn Bitcoin rewards? Like I think this is pretty fascinating because then you can say that. This thing is worth at least as much as the Bitcoin rewards you get. It's likely probably worth a lot. You could you could put up NFTs as collateral to like like imagine you know Arcadico where instead of only putting up collateral in cryptocurrencies, we're actually putting up NFT collateral and those that NFT is earning earning Bitcoin. Like think of these things as like Lego blocks, and the more Lego blocks there are, uh, and the more people can just like plug and play them, then it's about the the Kind of like the creative process of the developers and the entrepreneurs, and you just let it go loose. Right? And that, that's why you want to build uh, in the open. That's why you want to build in a decentralized way, 
And that's why you want to have a grassroots community. Like, I know this is a little bit off topic, but I feel like one of the best things about this, this tax ecosystem is actually the grassroots community. Like, there isn't any kind of like marketing pump going on. Like, people are organically discovering things. People are organically building. No one is like trying to like push for, you know, like, like exchange listings or this and that. This is like a organic movement, which is exactly what happened with Bitcoin. The reason why Bitcoin is so strong is that the community is so strong because they are all organically attracted to Bitcoin and they discovered it at their own pace. And and Bitcoin had kind of like, you know, the most decentralized way of launching ever. The same thing is happening with Miami coin, but Patrick is there, who's, who's contributed to it. It's a completely fair mining only launch. And I feel like that fits so well with the community that we built there. And, and, and I think we should, be, we should really appreciate this organic grassroots nature of, of what's going on. Great. Um, we've got a lot of questions coming in. Colin Thomas, go ahead with your question. Hey guys, how's it going? Uh, apologies for the sound in the back. I'm driving. Um, uh, I really like what you guys are doing with stacks, and you know, I really look forward to seeing you know um, how personally I can I can leverage that as well to build out you know my own NFTs and stuff like that on top of on top of what you guys are doing to be a part of that you know growth. Um, I. Uh, oh, geez, that's a completely blank on my question. Um, can you explain about like where? So one of the one of the criticisms I saw early on about NFTs on on Ethereum, for example, is their storage. How it's stored? How it's let's say um, on OpenSea, right? You mint something there. <clears throat> the NFT uh, provenance relies. Uh, or sorry, uh, um, resides on OpenSea, uh, maybe you can probably explain how that differs with what you guys are doing and and just what, what the benefits are there. So for, for example, I just saw a post today about um, about $100,000 worth of NFTs were, were uh, I guess, destroyed on OpenSea due to a bug in their um, their code or something. Uh, and I just wanted to find out, like, is something like that possible on what you guys are doing? What, what are the... the mitigation that you guys are taking for stuff like that? I think I think there are several different things going on here. So I want to like, peel them apart a little bit. The, the, the bug on OpenSea was not an OpenSea thing. As I understand it, it is like the, uh, the ENS system, which is their naming system, that had some sort of a mismatching going on. Uh, but in, in general, like, think of this as like, you know, OpenSea is a marketplace and they have smart contracts for certain functionality, and then the rest is kind of like infrastructure that they built, right? So, and, and 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 that is that is one aspect which I was commenting on earlier. But for making these things like truly decentralized, it would be amazing to push more in the direction of like you know, decentralized logging of our our services like these, or decentralized storage, and and, and so on. So that there's less less reliance on it. Uh, on a, on, a, on a marketplace. But the point that you're making around storage, I think that is a separate fundamental challenge um, because NFTs obviously have, you know, if it's a, a JPEG file or, you know, some sort of a media file, these things are quite large and you can't really store them at the blockchain itself. Uh, so you need to think about storage solutions, like where, where are these things going to live? The hashes of these things can live on a blockchain, but not, not, not the files themselves. And there are a bunch of options. Obviously, the SACS ecosystem has developed a decentralized storage option that is optimized for certain use cases. There are things like Rweave out there that are gaining traction, where it's a more like permanent archive um, for, for public data. And then obviously, they're benefiting from this NFT, NFT um, uh, kind of boom as well, where right? like people want to store their NFTs there because it's a, so it's a mix of these storage options, if, if that makes sense. I feel like the, the, uh, I know at a high level they were trying to get at, but you have to dig deeper into all these issues, and they're actually like pretty separate things going in different directions for the technology. Yeah, yeah, I think you understand like the higher uh, or deeper question there that I'm trying to ask about about that because I mean, yeah, yeah, I think I think from my understanding, right, the the NFTs themselves, the images themselves, 
are not being stored. It's almost like the hash of the image is being stored, right? Um, so just just trying to find out like how that differs from N from uh, NFTs on Ethereum and if it's the same, you know, concept or or whatever. But I totally, I conceptually, I agree with everything you guys are doing in terms of building on top of Bitcoin. That's kind of what I've been waiting for. Actually, you know, I've, I've been around for a long time, and you know, I I, I saw the boom in NFTs and, and stuff like that. And I, you know, understanding more about how they work on Ethereum, I kind of just knowing what I know about Ethereum itself, I, I was kind of got yeah, turned off about them in general. Um, granted, you know, people are there making money, but to me, it's, it's deeper than that. I'm, a, I'm an artist, so like, I make video games and I make 3D models for virtual worlds. So I understand a lot of these uh, the benefits of, of something like NFTs on top of, uh, you know, these different blockchains. But again, as you said earlier, having it on the most secure blockchain, the most uh, resilient um, is if you're thinking of art, I mean, that, that would be a very important property to, to, to retain. So, yeah. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's exactly it, right? So it's the, uh, it's the ownership, like how you verify the ownership. Uh, because the minting is happening on the stack side, but stacks transactions are, the, the hashes are ending up on Bitcoin. Plus, you could even take Bitcoin blocks as input into some generative art that, that, that you have, right? So you can... Your NFT could be valuable because it actually represents a Bitcoin block in certain ways. So there was an input into the algorithm through which uh, things being were generated and so on. So in long term, it's basically the difference between the, the provenance and the ownership of the NFT over anything else. I think the rest of the tech stack is uh, is less important than than the, than the core owner, ownership and kind of provenance. Yeah, totally. That's that's great. That's great to hear. How does this compare? And I apologize to take up Paul all the time, but how does this compare to, let's say, uh, RBF and um, RGB, sorry, and um, what they're doing and, and what the plan is? Well, I, I guess to explain a bit more, uh, like how, how does that differ from um, projects like RGB and and, and stuff like? Because I know a lot of people are trying to create NFTs using that technology, um, I, I guess I don't really understand fully how that differs. Yeah, uh, I think, I think that, that's, a, that's a, you did hit a kind of a very important point here, and uh, I, I'm planning to write a more detailed blog post about it. So whenever you talk about, you know, smart contracts for Bitcoin, a frequent thing that people mention is approaches like, you know, DLCs uh, or, or, or RGB, which is a project within the Lightning world. And I think yep. the, the biggest the biggest thing that, that what, what happens is because a lot of Bitcoiners just point to these solutions that, hey, you can have uh, smart contracts on Bitcoin through these things. No one really dives into the details, right? And, and the details matter a lot. Uh, these types of efforts, I classify them as off-chain contracts, meaning that they're actually limited by Bitcoin script and they cannot have the type of smart contracts that you see on Ethereum or Solana or, or some of these newer chains because they don't have they don't have global state. You're not interacting with a smart contract. You're basically the UX of these contracts is going to look like they're extremely limited. The UX would look like you coordinate with a party off chain. Let's say I want to do a transaction, I want to send an NFT to Trevor. I need to talk to Trevor in real life. And then sign like a hundred versions of a transaction, and then broadcast them. It's, it's like terrible. Like no one, no one would actually use it. So, I see. But, I see. So you're saying like the interface and and how we interact with it is is a lot more cumbersome. It, it's not as um, streamlined as something like Stacks would allow for. I I would I would even go for a step further. I would even say that these are not what people would think of. Stuff. They're very limited and off chain. They're not even on chain, meaning that. Uh, like when people think of smart contract, let's say you want to do a swap. You want to do a swap, you want to send a transaction to Uniswap and you know, you're swapped into a new asset. You can't even build that with, with these types of problems because they're just off chain. There's no uh, smart contract online that you can even interact with ever. Like that's just not possible. Then. So I think, I think there's this narrative uh, that has built up that hey, these are really smart contract solutions. There's something very different. Like there's some sort of an off-chain, limited type of a contracting system, and and nothing like what what the generally accepted understanding of smart contracts is. Gotcha, gotcha. Thank you for answering my question. Yeah, I I, 
I, um, I, I know a lot of times when we talk about these topics, we kind of gloss over a lot of these technical differences, and that's that's kind of what what important what's important to me because you know that understanding the difference between Ethereum and Bitcoin was kind of what drew me to Bitcoin specifically. Um, I started out you know buying Ethereum first, but then I understood more about the technology, and, and um, to me, Bitcoin served a, a, you know the purpose that I, I aligned with my values and what I what I thought about the world and stuff. So. Um, yeah, so I appreciate you answering the question. Thanks, Colin. Param, go ahead with your question. Hey, guys. Uh, my name's Param. Um, so I have a quick question. Uh, the people want to know, the ecosystem wants to know, and I want to know. <laughs> uh, Muni, maybe you might have the answer for this, or Tio. Coinbase, uh, I know we just got on their custodial wallet. And so I'm just wondering, like, what's what's the conversation they're like and then my second question is actually about uh jack dorsey and his like efforts with square and mike brock i think that's his name um is there any conversation what's the development there if you guys can update us i i, I would greatly appreciate it i think the exchange the exchange is one is very simple but you know my my company basically just doesn't comment on it doesn't work on it uh, we know that Coinbase integrated the new stacks to Final Network and pushed Custody Live, but it's, it's totally up to the exchanges. Like we, I, I don't have any information and I don't work on any, any exchanges. In terms of Dorsey, like we are friendly with, with them. Uh, my my company uh, is kind of like, you know, uh, talking to them, but mostly at, like we're trying to educate them about all the options available in the Bitcoin system. And, uh, you know, I, it will be very interesting to see like what, what what comes out of that because they definitely want to build in the Bitcoin ecosystem and frankly there aren't a lot of options there unless they want to try and roll out reinvent the wheel uh, and then do do a bunch of the stuff that uh, stacks about everything. You know, regarding Coinbase, it, anyone in the community can reach out to their support or their head of listings, and if you want to reply to them with like funny memes or comments, just as long as you're being polite and being respectful. I think that's totally within <laughs> within the realm of like uh, okay things to do to help push that forward if you want to. Okay, sweet. Uh, my last question is Trevor, uh, what are you most excited about in this ecosystem or just looking at the landscape and, and, and all of it like being really close to the startups, what are you most excited about? Yeah, that's such a hard question. Um, I'm probably not going to since I'm just answering this off the cuff, um, maybe I would think of something if I had more time, but I would say really what gets me up in the morning is this community and like all the people involved. And one of the, the biggest reasons that I decided to, uh, you know, come to Patrick and Mindy and everybody uh, to propose this accelerator was twofold. One was just because I'm a developer and I like the technology and I immediately saw that like there was this, this sweet spot that the core devs had identified in terms of, you know, it's super secure and it's also scalable. It's also fast to a point where like, you know, with micro blocks having come out now, actually that's something I got me super excited yesterday when I started seeing, I just saw micro blocks live in the Explorer. I know it's been live for a while, but actually seeing it represented in the Explorer was super exciting. Um, so just like, you know, if you can get your, your transactions confirmed in like two to three seconds with a micro block, like, I don't think that going to one second or going to 0.5 seconds or, you know, the trade-offs that you have to make to go from like two seconds, you know, kind of gets like exponentially harder, right. To go from like, you know, the distance between two seconds and one second is the same for one second, half a second, but to a human being, it doesn't really make that big of a difference, right? And so just seeing the team had identified the sweet spot with technology, the bluish opportunity on Bitcoin, that there's so much Bitcoin holders who don't have a way to interact with smart contracts and apps. But then really it came down to like seeing how collaborative the community is and how professional they are. I mean, there's a lot of um, communities in the crypto space where it's a lot of fluff. It's a lot of kind of BS and you know, a lot of hype and like Stacks has always been like this, like quiet, um, like build first and like do the work first and build something great and like don't 
you know, don't talk about it as, as much, don't spread the hype. Um, and, and seeing that the community is really collaborative, works well together. There's a, there's a lot of crypto communities where, you know, it's, there's so much greed in some of these communities that people are not collaborative, uh, because so much money is at stake. Everybody's just trying to get their own, get their own and, and, and politics are, you know, rampant in some of these crypto communities, but the stacks is, I didn't see any of that. And so coming to this community, having known Mini for so long and known Patrick for several years and the, um, like building from there and building a great community, like for Stacks Accelerator, we're all about the community. Um, that for us is what's going to differentiate us. Like you see a, a lot of crypto ecosystems too, like throwing or at least claiming in the media, they're throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at startups. And I just don't think that approach is going to work at all. It has nothing to do. I mean, it has something to do with the capital, but at some point it just comes down to what value do you actually provide? Do you have that community? Like when we bring our next cohort in and we have the founders of this cohort who we've, you know, done so much for, and we've built those bonds with coming back to support our future founders. That's what the game changer is going to be. That's what's going to attract the best founders is to, the desire to be part of that community and sort of, um, you know, really just proving ourselves to the broader investor community that we are a founder friendly ecosystem, building our reputation to show that we're adding value to the companies that we're doing good work. Um, that's going to really, what's going to accelerate us as a brand and build our community to where, uh, that was what's going to differentiate stacks even further than, uh, having the great technology, but I'm grateful that we have both, you know? Yeah, I, I want to quickly add that the fact that some ecosystems are throwing money at the problem, my guess is it's going to end up hurting them because then you attract the wrong type of founders. You're attracting people who are coming in for the money and they're not coming in because they like the tooling or they believe in you know what they're building. They're coming in primarily for the money. And I think pulling them with money, like if there, there, there has been several examples of that tends to not work. You need the organic growth. So, so when Trevor told us that, hey, we're just going to write small checks. We're just going to help them. We're going to attract people that actually want to come and build there. Like I think that was actually a pretty, pretty important uh, reason for me to get excited about. Um, I, I just like I, I like to add to what both Manib and, and Trevor said because the thing is, these guys actually practice what they preach. And having been in this accelerator with what. 26, 27 other companies, and no one is competing with each other. Every single company is actually supporting each other, working together. I mean, it's the most collaborative environment you, you could imagine. And that's testament to Manib's work, Manib's perspective, Manib's vision. You know, Trevor is, you know, following that vision. And, and, and that, that makes something that is absolutely different, I think, to any other ecosystem out there. So it's really, really amazing. And I, I just want to thank Mani, Trevor, all the people on the team, Alex, all of you. You know, this has been an absolutely amazing experience. And, um, yeah, I'm really excited about tomorrow, looking forward to tomorrow. And uh, I, I don't want to leave the right direction. Okay, Peter, Peter, we, we have a graduation day separately, okay? That's when we're going to all crying, okay? Save it for then. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Um, I, I know we're running. I'll just share my shortest call, just for a few seconds. My shortest interview for the accelerator program was when, when some guy joined, and it was like his secretary was trying to set up, and it was hard to even set it up. Finally, we get on a call. It lasted two minutes. He comes on a call and says, I had this accelerator and that accelerator or our ecosystem pay me X amount of money. What will you guys offer me? And my reply was lit. I was just, I was like, I was like stunned with that directness. And I paused and I said, thank you for the call. And I just hung up. It was like, these kind of people do not belong here. Um, so it, it is like something that we think is we kind of take pride of that. We, we want to attract people that just want to build things for the sake of building things. And, making things better. And then of course they need some money to grow, but people coming in demanding money because they think they're something special. Um, I don't think you're gonna, the system is not gonna really benefit long-term from that, so. Very good point. James, go ahead with your question. 
<laughs> I'm uh, been a big fan of the project for some time. I uh, appreciate the way you guys go about your business. Uh, just quickly, I've heard you describe Stats as being uh, slower than some of the uh, chains getting a lot of the press lately, like Solana, but that there was also some ways of speeding things up down the line. I'm just wondering if you're able to elaborate quickly on what some of those solutions might look like. Thanks. Yeah, I, I just had a pretty detailed uh, post on the forum about it, and I think I encourage everyone to go and read it. But I can I can give the TLDR here. Um, so the TLDR is effectively, I think you should think of uh, stacks, just like Bitcoin, optimizing for decentralization and uh, independent verification. Like so, so on the spectrum of things, like you know, if you could run a miner or a node on a laptop on a computer versus you know it's high powered expensive hardware but maybe you can still run it uh, at home or on the extreme end it's like hey it has to be like in a data center right it's a data center chain stacks wants to be like on the anyone can run this on a laptop right so once you make that decision you've kind of like made the decision about the effective capacity and bandwidth of the network right? uh, but that doesn't mean that you can't have high scalability. It's just that, you know, that layer that provides that high scalability uh, needs to look a little bit different. So I've been working on this uh, proposal for subnets. So subnets effectively uh, take the inverse of that design trade off. Uh, on a subnet, a subset of the stacks miners can, can operate there, but they can have uh, higher bandwidth requirements for the miners. Right? So not at the base layer, because I think the base layer needs to be open to everybody. But on a on a subnet, you could you could actually have 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 that type of optionality where you're scoring lower on decentralization, but you're actually getting much higher speeds and much higher throughput, much like the the newer generation chains that people are getting used to. The difference here is going to be the newer chains are not being very upfront about the sacrifices that they're making on the decentralization side, and they're not giving you the option of actually. Uh, actually having the main chain be for this advice. So I, I see this as like, you can get the best of both worlds. Uh, the, the, the main chain needs to optimize for decentralization, and then you, you can get the, the, the higher scalability from subnets or, or some proposals like app chains that you have. But I will highly recommend people to go and go to forum.stacks.org. Uh, and I, I have a very detailed blog post there that basically goes into all of these trade offs, all of the frameworks, and things just from the day. Great, awesome. Jeremy, go ahead with your question. I'm sorry, Jeremy, go ahead with your question. Hey guys, thank you so much for all you guys do on the back end. Um, I really, it's amazing to see what you guys are doing. Uh, my question is this, how come there's not um, more developers doing what you guys are doing? And supposedly there's more developers on other chains, according to people like Ralph Paul. Second question is, seeing as to how Bitcoin is such a soundly engineered protocol and it is only makes sense to build something on a solid foundation. That's how I, I view Bitcoin. I'm a civil engineer. I studied Bitcoin for many, many hours and thousands of hours actually to come to that conclusion. So is it fair to say that all the other protocols that are being built off of Bitcoin is almost just like experimental to the point that the people building on Bitcoin will just use what doesn't, what works in the experimental world? On those chains and then be brought to bitcoin and i don't want to be, make that sound like a closed-minded question because i'm very pragmatic but but what is wrong with that question or statement and uh thank you for what you do who would like to take that one <laughs> Uh, I can I can quickly comment, uh, and then I'm gonna. I think I might need to run out of this one. So I, I would say in general, yes, there has been this thesis. Uh, you should read like uh, Wences Cesaris, he's the CEO of Zappo. He has this uh, great article, uh, uh, a case for a small allocation to Bitcoin that I highly recommend everyone to read. And in that, he has this uh, Bitcoin thesis that is effectively that any uh, experiments in crypto, if they're successful can eventually get implemented in the Bitcoin ecosystem. And I feel like the work that Stacks is doing 
is pretty much kind of like realizing that that piece is right. So I think I think I agree with you. But then I think we we, we at the same time we don't want to be too simplistic about it as well. There might be certain innovation that comes out uh, that that is interesting, that is unique, and I think we need to remain kind of like open to what's what, what's what's happening in the in the, in the broader uh, crypto community. Thanks, Mani. We are unfortunately at time. I know we have a bunch of other questions here. Um, Gary and Peter, where can we get more information on Layer and Musidio? Sure. Um, hey, Layer.com. Um, definitely taking some uh, early if you want to test us on testnet. Um, feel free to fill out the form. Uh, and I'll pass it over to uh, Peter. Yep, Twitter's fine. And uh, uh, Peter at Residio.com. All right, friends, last few things. One, if you have any suggestions for the future crypto internet show, please share those with us through a direct message. Secondly, we will be back on Thursday the 16th, where we will discuss Bitcoin as a productive asset. That's it for now. Have a great evening. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.